William Wyler's career was one of the greatest success stories in motion pictures. Almost 50 years of distinguished filmmaking. He made 37 feature films, and the movie industry honored him more than any director in its history. Three Academy Awards, 12 nominations for directing, and another three for producing. Wyler was interviewed for this film in July of 1981. He died three days later. This is a portrait of the man and his work. It's wonderful in having a director that has a very strong presence. You know, I wanted to please him. I wanted him to like it. I wanted him to like me. Actors uh, love to work with Willie. And I think that probably one of the reasons is because uh, he directed more Academy Award winning performances than I think almost any other director. I owed all that. I owed so much thinking in my life since to Wyler. So much thinking. He had a, a wonderful taste, a splendid judgment. If uh, Willie Wyler told me to jump in the Hudson River, I would. I would have done anything he asked me. He was the classiest picture maker, I think, that ever lived. It's a mystery. It's an utter mystery to me. Where Willie got it. Willie Wyler was born in 1902 in Alsace Lorraine in a town called Malouz. When he was 18, his father tried to interest him in the family business, a clothing store. But his mother took him to meet Carl Lemley, her famous cousin who had gone to America and founded Universal Studios. And Uncle Carl, as he was called, changed Willie's life forever. As we were talking, he said, how would you like to come to America? I was thunderstruck because at those days it was like making a trip to the moon. He said, I'll give you a job and from then on you're on your own. He deducted $5 a week from my salary to pay for the boat trip. Well, that's how I came to America. I had no idea of going into the moving picture business. After a year in the New York office, he told Uncle Carl that he wanted to go to Hollywood. In the early 1920s, Hollywood was a boom town full of excitement, gambling, and romance. Willie, with his boundless energy, fit right in. By this time, I was interested in the making of films. When I asked to become a director, I told Carl Lemley about it, and he called in the supervisor of Westerns and said, this boy wants to become a director. And the supervisor of Westerns said, well, it's fine, but he's not ready yet. First, I had to get promoted from fourth assistant to third assistant to second assistant to first assistant. Finally, they gave me a tour of Western, and it turned out all right. You see, in those days, it was like a school making little westerns because they all demanded action. And the basis of motion pictures is really action. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you shot the picture. Sometimes a few shots be left over for Thursday, but then Friday, you'd get a new script. Saturday, you cast it. Then Monday, you start shooting. The budget was $2,000 for the whole picture. The stories were all very elementary. There was a villain and a leading man and a girl. No sex, nothing like that. Couldn't even kiss the girl till the last shot in the picture. Then he could kiss the girl. During the next three years, Weiler directed 27 two-reel and five-reel westerns. He learned his craft. Then it was an easy jump to feature films. In his early 30s, after a 12-year apprenticeship, Willie won his spurs directing America's greatest living actor, John Barrymore, in Counselor at Law. Good morning, Senator. Yeah, fine. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's the way with those murder cases, a lot of publicity and no money. Yes, yes, I did. As I explained to you, a decrease of two cents a pound will put my clients out of business. Don't get so excited, Senator. There's nothing illegal about lobbying, you know. If they're worried, if they lock up half the people in Washington. No, I'm not trying to block the entire bill. I'm merely acting in the interest of my clients as you're acting in the interest of the people of Montana. Come in, Mr. Russo, now. Listen, Senator, why don't you hop on a midnight sleeper and have lunch with you tomorrow? 12.30 at the Lawyer's Club, fine. And give my regards to that charming daughter of yours. Make a transcript of that, Senator, right around the Colonel Wertheimer. Morning, Mr. Rue. Oh, Rexy, you better cut out that stuff about the murder cases, you know. And give me Mr. Vanderbilt on the phone right away. Have a chocolate cream. Uh oh, I'm on a diet, but if you got a cigarette. Sure, there they are. Help yourself. Thanks. There's a salmon on the phone. Oh, give me a minute. Sure. Hello, Hello darling. The great profile had a reputation for being difficult, so the film's success enhanced Weiler's reputation. His reward was directing Universal's ethereal new star, Margaret Sullivan, in The Good Fairy. She was an important star at Universal when I was a very young director. She had a special gift was being very attractive. They clashed fiercely on the set, but made up privately at night. As soon as the picture was finished, they married. But it was not a happy match. Within two years, they divorced. In 1935, 
Weiler met an independent producer who had his own studio and a reputation for toughness and quality. Samuel Goldwyn offered Weiler a seven-year contract. I jumped at the opportunity because I'd just come from Universal making sort of second-class pictures, and Goldwyn was making first-class pictures. And I was told he wanted to make The Children's Hour. The Children's Hour was a controversial play with whisperings of lesbianism. In those days, censorship was very strict, and that's where I met Lillian Hellman. She wrote a very fine script, and she is the one who explained to me that the theme of the picture is not lesbianism. It's not about lesbianism, it's about a lie. And I happened to pick what I thought was a very strong lie. There are many other kinds of lies. Well, it was late at night, and Miss Doby's room was right next to ours, and... Mary! Do you know what you're saying? I had to change the title and never mention Children's Hour, because that was all part of the censorship requirements of the day. The picture we made was more a conventional triangle. And one night you were in Miss Doby's room late. Why did you think it was wrong for me to be in Miss Doby's room? Be because... Because it was at night and I was leaning down by the keyhole and I saw things and I got scared and then you left and... and, and Ask her again how she could see us. I was leaning down by the keyhole. There's no keyhole on my door. What? That was the beginning of the Goldwyn Weiler relationship. Of course, he was the most important producer in my career. They say one day it's a Weiler touch, next day it's a Goldwyn touch. You end up not knowing whose touch it was. I had a scene where Joel McRae was in an outfit of a bee hunter. Anyway, I got stung by a bee. Next day, the publicity department had it that Goldwyn was stung by a bee. <laughs> uh, I didn't care, only I wish it had been true. <laughs> Weiler's uncommonly good ear for dialogue led him to some of the finest writers of his time. An adaptation of Sinclair Lewis's Dodsworth got him his first Academy Award nomination. I hadn't realized it was your birthday. No, wish I hadn't. No woman enjoys getting to be 35. When you're my age, you'll look back on 35 as a most agreeable time of life, Mrs. Dodsworth. I hope I look as young as you do uh, when I'm your age. You're almost sure to, my dear. After Dodsworth, Weiler was on a roll. And Goldwyn offered him another Broadway hit, Dead End. Lillian Hellman wrote the screenplay. Dead End was about a slum district in an upper-class neighborhood. And Willie had quite rightly littered the street with garbage and gar garbage cans. And Goldwyn wandered down the set and said, it's a disgusting-looking, filthy set. He said to Wilder, clean it up. Just clean it up. I won't have it. Goldwyn was always... How should I say his pictures? He wanted his pictures to be clean and glamorous. All the women looking beautiful. The hair just in place, you know, so you can see the hairdresser work and the makeup man and the clothes, everything speak and span. And, well, uh, not all pictures lend themselves to that. <laughs> Between projects, Goldwyn loaned Weiler out to other studios. Willie really is responsible for the fact that I became a box office star. Jezebel was really the first one. Bring that over here. Mm -hmm. Saucy, isn't it? And vulgar. Yes, isn't it? Come on, get me out of this. Julie, what are you doing? If it fits me, I'm going to wear it to the Olympus Bowl. A red dress to the Olympus Bowl while you're out of your senses? Mademoiselle Jeune Fille ne porte pas une robe comme ça. D'ailleurs, c'est une robe de cette Marie Vicaire. That creature, Julie. You heard what Madame Poulard said. That infamous Vickers woman. Marie Vickers couldn't possibly do it justice. Child, you're out of your mind. You know you can't wear red to the Olympus Ball. Can't I? I'm going to. This is 1852, Dumplin. 1852. Not the Dark Ages. Girls don't have to simp around in white just because they're not married. In New Orleans, they do. Julie, you'd insult every woman on the floor. Mademoiselle, your aunt, she's right. Look how beautiful this dice is. Will you kindly get me out of this? Julie, you can't be serious. Never more serious in my life. He was an amazingly inarticulate man about what he wanted. He really, when he saw it, 
he knew that's what he wanted. But it was very hard for him to say. He would just say, we'd do it again. Willie would have his cast probably run a scene three or four times. He would just sit there having coffee and donuts every morning. Then he would get up and he would say, I like this you did, I like that you did, unless he ran into an actor who was incompetent. And then he was not very tolerant. He always said, I do not run an acting school. <laughs> In the ballroom scene, she was supposed to be wearing a red dress, and this was before color pictures. So I chose a black satin dress, which was shiny, but they seemed to accept it. Hello, Molly. Miss Kendrick, hello, Dick. It's Stephen, Jelly. Stephanie, we must pay our respects to Miss Zimmer. You'll excuse us, please. Mm. The waltz scene. In the script, that said, Julie goes to the Comus Ball, and the assistant scheduled it for one day, and we were on that scene for one week and a half. Betty and I had a very good relationship. I was very happy working with her. He never, ever said whether he liked a take or not. So after about a week of this, I went up to him, and I said, I just have to know if I'm pleasing you in any way. <laughs> so the entire next day, <laughs> after every scene, he would go, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. So after about three of these, I said, please go back to your own ways. I can't stand this. Bye, Julie. Is that all you've got to say to me? There's nothing more to say. Evidently, you've made up your mind. No, Julie. You've made up my mind. Goodbye, Press. Bye, Julie. In 1938, Weiler directed some musical sequences in a Goldwyn film featuring violinist Yasha Heifetz. An amateur fiddler himself, Weiler couldn't resist switching roles with the renowned virtuoso. One day, an aspiring actress from Dallas visited the set. And we met. And after a little bit, he said, um, do you like to look at tennis? And I said, yes, I like to look at tennis. And um, we went to the tennis matches, and we went to the tennis matches every day, and we saw each other every evening. And insanely, 10 days later, we decided to get married. It's been difficult afterwards telling my children to uh, wait carefully to get to know people well. <laughs> it's been hard. <laughs> But I don't know, it was just the feeling that I had. I didn't plan to give up my career after I married. I think Willie was much too smart to say that. And after my first child was born, Kathy, I did go back to work, and I began to think, well, what's so great about this? You're sitting on a dark soundstage all day long, waiting. The whole thing just sort of petered away absolutely painlessly. And I've never regretted it. I was very lucky to find her. I didn't look among the movie stars, although she was a starlet. She even made a test for Gone with the Wind. But I was lucky she didn't get the part. <laughs> Wuthering Heights, the timeless love story established Laurence Olivier as a leading man in films. He made me a good film actor by teaching me in an extremely rough, insulting way that I don't know who I thought I was, but I wasn't. Kathy. Heathcliff. Why did you stay so long in that house? Didn't expect to find you here. Why did you stay so long? Why? Because I was having a wonderful time. 
a delightful, fascinating, wonderful time among human beings. Go and wash your face and hands, Heathcliff. And comb your hair so that I needn't be ashamed of you in front of a guest. They were shooting one particular scene over and over again, and finally, Olivia would come to him and says, look, Willie, for God's sake, we, been, we did that thing 60 times. I did it standing up, I did it sitting down, I did it fast, I did it slow. How do you want me to do it? And Wyler just said, better. I was overacting a porn and doing some extravagant gesture. And he'd say, keep stopping me, for Christ's sake, what do you think you're doing? You think you're at the Opera House? Manchester or something, what are you doing? Well, come down to earth, come on. I want it, I want it, so I know you mean it. Forgive me, Heathcliff. Forgive me. Make the world stop right here. Make everything stop and stand still and never move again. Make the moors never change and you and I never change. The moors and I will never change. Don't you, Kathy? I can't. I can't. No matter what I ever do or say, Heathcliff, this is me now. Standing on this hill with you, this is me forever. He was Olivier Goldwyn said, this actor here, if he goes on playing like that, I'm going to call off the picture. Look at him. He's, he's filthy. He's dirty. I said, he's playing a stable boy, you know? I can remember being waked at night by Willie thrashing around in bed, grinding his teeth, and he finally woke up and he said he was arguing with Goldwyn. <laughs> so this was going on 24 hours a day. Goldwyn said, I don't like to see, look at dead people at the end of a picture. So he wanted me to shoot a scene of the two of them walking through the clouds. I said, I just won't do it. Well, he had somebody else do it. And he got two doubles shot from the back. That shot is still in the picture. It's awful. We had a sort of a love-hate relationship. We'd have fights. But the fights were not over money. They were over what I just said, you know, by matters of taste. And once Goldwyn was committed, he was a generous producer. I mean, he had a great deal of pride in the pictures he produced. On another loan out to Warner Brothers, Weiler filmed Somerset Mom's story of jealousy and revenge, establishing the mood of the entire picture in one seamless shot. The opening shot of a letter was in a rubber plantation near Singapore and a set was built. So I devised a very complex shot, complex and also limited because we were on a sound stage and couldn't shoot in every direction. Today they'd go to Singapore and, and <laughs> go to a real rubber plantation. Maybe it would be better, maybe it wouldn't be as good. Mr. Wyler could be very rough in insisting on what he wanted. Leslie, tell me, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. There was one serious fight on the letter over the reading of a single line. Wyler wanted Davis to speak the climactic words looking her husband directly in the eyes. The actress insisted that her character would turn away. What is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. It's the one time I left the stage, but I came back. Uh, at the AFI award ceremony. I remember one line of dialogue. We disagreed strongly on how it should be read. Even today, 37 years later, we still disagree on it. <laughs> 
Yes, that was the one big, big difference of opinion. I still think I was right. I think I was right, but she, I'm sure Betty thinks she was right. And I wouldn't be surprised if right now I told her to come out to Warner Brothers studio, we'll shoot the scene over her way, she would come. <laughs> he was as mischievous as anybody I knew, and it was full of fun, too. He was willing to do anything. That was what made him such fun. He used to take me to work on a motorcycle. He would call for me at my house, and we'd go zooming around Hollywood, and zooming in and out of cars. He was a madman on his, madman on his motorcycle, madman in those downhill things he did in Europe. No, he was very much thought of a wild man that way. He would ski like mad. He just got on him and came down without any of the, of the techniques that we are taught today in ski school. Well, he loved thrills. Well, he was a great man walking a narrow ledge at a dizzy height. <laughs> and anything that had a, a touch of uh, challenge to it, why, Willie rose to. He was a, a very uh, able, quick man with his body and fine coordination. Back on the Golden Lot, Weiler and Betty Davis collaborated a third time on Lillian Hellman's tale of greed in the Old South, The Little Foxes. She plays a woman as a daughter, 19 or 20. Actually, she wasn't even 40, she was in her late 30s. So she tried to play old and nasty. As regards the playing of Regina, he just wanted her sort of done more subtly. And she wasn't a subtle woman to me at all. She was right out and out. I've always been lucky. I'll be lucky again. The bottle. Please, upstairs, in my room, in the drawer. The main thing in the scene is not the man trying to go upstairs to get the medicine. It's Betty Davis sitting on a couch, and it's all going on behind her. There was another thing about this scene that nobody knows. Herbert Marshall, who played the man, has a wooden leg and cannot run up the stairs. So he 